Just ahead on American Black Journal, the African World Festival in Detroit celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Charles H. Wright Museum. We'll get details on the exciting events planned for this year's festival, plus we'll remember the late Nell Farr when we take a look back at his recent appearance on this program. American Black Journal starts now. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Jennifer White sitting in for Stephen Henderson. This is a monumental year for the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. The museum was founded 50 years ago and the anniversary celebration kicks into high gear at this year's African World Festival. The event takes place on the grounds of the museum over the weekend of August 14th. Each year, more than 150,000 people take part in this celebration of African culture. The festival features music, art, food, and fashion. There are some very special activities planned this year, including a 5K race and a Detroit-themed fashion show. Here to fill us in are members of the festival's planning team. Najia Kai is the festival director. Stephen Singleton is coordinator of the race. And Piper Carter is managing the fashion show. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I want to start with you, Najia. Tell me about what we can expect this year. When people show up at the museum, what are they going to see? Well, they're going to see another great year at the uh, Wright Museum. We spread out across all the green spaces there and down the street with about 120 vendors in our marketplace with uh, food from the Caribbean, from African America, as well as from the continent of Africa. We have uh, a main stage that's jam-packed with music from all around the world. And of course, close here at home, we uh, present a lot of local uh, performers, as well as there's a big children's area. There's an area for teens. There's an area for the elders. We really try to provide a panoramic view and a sample of uh, African culture and traditions, as well as contemporary arts. A little bit of something for, for everybody mm -hmm. to take advantage of. Yeah, try of. to reflect the museum's mission in the festival each year and give our audience an opportunity to enjoy the various flavors and colors and styles and rhythms of the culture that obviously is all over the world. How does it feel to kick off the museum's 50th anniversary I mean, to really drive that celebration with, with the festival. Well, I can admit that I was uh, here in Detroit uh, when the museum was founded. And so it's exciting now to know that the museum has survived and thrived over these 50 years. And we've chosen the theme of shining as we rise for the festival this year to reflect the golden anniversary of the Wright Museum and also our vision of the future where we see our young people carrying the museum and the festival. Uh, forward into the future at least another 50 years. Mm -hmm. Now Piper part of the celebration is a festival, uh, rather a uh, fashion show and are you featuring Detroit based uh, designers and, and models? What, what will that fashion show look like? So basically um, Detroit Rocks the Runway is the vision of uh, Njia Kai and so what I do is uh, act as the hands to make that uh, vision come true. So we actually have 12 designers that are from all from Detroit. Wow. And I've actually brought something from one of the designers so you guys can get a, a little sample of uh, what you'll see. So beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Um, everything um, from all the designers is handmade and um, everything is uh, actually being made as we speak. So you uh, got a week left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that and that's wonderful. And um, everything will be on sale okay. um, the next, the following day. So um, you'll come Saturday, which is the fifteenth at nine p.m. You'll see a wonderful show with dance as well as fashion, and it will be reflective of fifty years uh, to uh, pay homage and honor to uh, Detroit style. Uh, through uh, African culture and hip hop. And uh, we have Mama Soul, who is going to be our featured artist from Flint. Mm -hmm. And we have a wonderful team 
uh, that is backing us and supporting us. Um, how did how did you identify the designers to use in the fashion show? Well, what we did is um, well, there have been we did a mix of designers that have um, been a part of the fashion show. So we wanted to make sure that we uh, connect the dots because we do practice our African culture of respecting our history and where mm -hmm. we come from, and so um, we have half of the designers are designers that have been a part, like uh, Sanika, and then um, we did a call out to new designers, young designers, and um, not so young. And so uh, this piece that I just showed you is um, Visual Noise, which is uh, Dawn Smith, and um, she's actually an elder that is designing wonderful clothing for all ages. Um, and we really wanted to um, show designers that have clothing for the community that's reflective of um, who Detroit is. So all shapes and sizes and ages, um, because it's a fa it's a family festival. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a professional show um, that is um, showing the beauty of all of who we are. Now, Nigia, you mentioned some of the incredible food I know that's going to be at the festival and there will be an opportunity for people to maybe work off some of that food in advance of enjoying it. There's a 5k race Stephen. tell us about that you're organizing that race. Well I'm, I'm organizing the race because I felt that it was very important for the community to be healthy and one way of, of being healthy and staying healthy is through walking and running. So as the race director, I decided it would be a good opportunity to join in the African World Festival and allow uh, a one-mile one fun run walk and a 5K fun run walk. And I believe that because uh, I visited the museum 50 years ago, um, my brother Richard, who was a very good friend of Dr. Wright, excuse me, Dr. Wright, he um, wanted us to be involved in the community and he wanted us to understand our African heritage and our African American heritage. And one of the ways by doing that is it was keeping us involved. And he stayed, stayed involved and I wanted to do the same thing. So for 50 years I said a race should be done. Now I think for people hearing 5K race that might sound a little daunting uh, for a first time, but, but it, you can, you, we were talking a little bit a moment ago and you were saying, well you can walk it or you can do a combination of walk and run, so you don't have to be in incredible shape to participate in this uh, Not at all. It, it, this is just for family, community, and unity. And this is what the theme of, of black culture is all about, unity. And so coming out, um, being able to walk a mile, or run a mile and then be involved with community and the area is fantastic. You know, um, I really were, were very, very thankful because of the, the amount of people that have called in and asked about the running, mm -hmm. as well as um, uh, we had New Balance, who uh, was going to be a sponsor, uh, the police chief of Wayne State University, uh, the president and vice president. Um, and uh, Commander Betterson, as well as the uh, Detroit Police Department, were all supportive in getting this race set up. And this also works as a fundraiser for, for the museum, is that correct? Yes, actually, this, my portion of it is uh, all the proceeds will go to the children's program within the museum. Uh, my brother was a big, you know, Richard Singleton was a very big supporter of children and the efforts that we need to enrich the children with, with understanding and education. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the reason why I'm, I'm here and supporting that, that opportunity. Najia, when you think about your vision for this festival and how you'd like to see it continue to expand and develop, what do you see moving forward? Well, we hope to continue to expand on the opportunity to introduce our community to the African world. And that's uh, a panoramic view of African descended folks in all places of the globe. So we hope to bring in more international uh, performers, more international installations and interactives. And we also want to explore the science and technologies that we are involved in and have those more present with some hands-on uh, interactive activities at the festival. And when you think about the audience for the festival, it's not just for African-American people or people from the African diaspora. Is this an opportunity also to maybe give other people some insight into 
and to our culture and history. Well, this is another of the great major public events here in Detroit. And as we know, all these major public events are open to everyone. So we hope that we've moved past the notion that something that's called an African or black event that's held in public spaces are, are not welcoming all people. We are now in the center of Midtown, in the center of the cultural uh, district of our city. And we certainly hope that everyone will see this as an opportunity to come and explore, experience, taste, and enjoy the various flavors of uh, art and music and food and fashion uh, that will be present there. It's something for everybody, all ages. It's all free, mm -hmm. uh, 11 to 11 each day, Friday through Sunday, August 14th through 16th. And absolutely, we welcome all. Now, Piper, when it comes to that fashion piece, why do you think that's an important piece to include in this festival? What does fashion tell us about our culture? Well, first of all, um, fashion is a language. And so um, there's lots of uh, speech <laughs> being had in the patterns as well as the cuts. But it's also an opportunity for um, entrepreneurship. And it's also an opportunity for um, people to support local designers. And um, that's really important in terms of our local economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in terms of the models who we'll see? Yes. How did you recruit those people? Are there people from the community? or Yes, it's people from the community, professional models. Um, it's a mix. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important that we um, represent all of who we are. So there's stuff for the guys as well. There's stuff for our elders. And um, like I said, there's all shapes and, and uh, you know, every, all the, the beauty of who and what we are mm -hmm. is going to be represented. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for us when we're sharing our culture. Nadia, if people want to learn more about the festival, understand how the activities are laid out over the weekend, where should they go? Uh, they can go to the Wright Museum's website and click on African World Festival and find the information there. We can, uh, they can call our office uh, at the Wright Museum and just ask for the uh, African World Festival office. And they can also go to our website at awfdetroit.com. And is there still p time for people to sign up for the race? Most definitely. You can sign up even on race day. So I encourage everyone to come out and join us. It's a family affair. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Najia, Piper, Stephen, and take this opportunity to, to check out the, the festival that's coming up. Just ahead on American Black Journal, we'll remember football legend and businessman Mel Farr with a look back at his recent guest appearance on this program that's coming up right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1966, a civil disturbance occurred on Kirchhoff Street when residents protested against police brutality. In 1971, church leader Prophet Jones died of a heart attack. And in 1977, Float On by the Floaters was the number one song on the soul chart. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. American Black Journal and Detroit Public Television extend our sympathy to the family of Detroit Lions great Mel Farr. The football legend and entrepreneur passed away last week at the age of 70. Farr played seven seasons for the Lions. After his football career, he built an auto dealership that became the country's largest black-owned business. Farr was among the Detroiters selected for the National African American History Makers Archive. He joined fellow honorees Martha Reeves and George Shirley here on American Black Journal last year. The Library of Congress is now the permanent home for a collection of thousands of videotaped interviews detailing the black experience. The archive is called the History Makers, and it's the largest African-American oral history video collection in the country. The first-person accounts are from well-known and unsung African-Americans who talk about their struggles, dreams, and achievements. I'm pleased to welcome three of those history makers to American Black Journal. Entrepreneur and former football star Mel Farr, Motown legend Martha Reeves, and renowned tenor and educator George Shirley. Thanks for being here. This is probably the most powerful, star-studded uh, cast I've had on this show. Uh, I grew up uh, sort of idolizing and listening and watching all of you, so uh, it's a real honor to, for me to have you here on American Black Journal. Well, Thank a, you for it's inviting me. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about the project. I mean, that's that's something that uh, you're giving these oral histories to the Library of Congress. 
Well, you know, uh, Juliana, uh, um, uh, several years ago, uh, you know, thought of the idea of, uh -huh. uh, of archiving uh, the uh, the events of uh, of, of, of uh, Black history makers, you know, right. and uh, and she's done a great great job, I, I tell you, of, of getting that information and, and archiving it so that uh, uh, our grandkids and grandkids uh, uh, could uh, uh, to to see uh, what uh, you know we've done, and, right? Uh, and uh, so I think that that's uh, very important. Uh, what she's done, and uh, we really, ne really need to take our hat off to her. Right, right. And you guys are also going to, to schools to talk to to young kids about this stuff, just to remind people where we all come from, right? Yes, uh, my yeah. visit to the Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts was really exciting. Uh, some of his uh, relatives are actually there. Some of his oh, is that right? Yeah, uh, as uh, as uh, students, as students, really? and uh, it gave me an, a, a, a quite a, a concert very, very talented babies being trained in the right way. Uh, I always give advice to if, if you want to be in this business or to excel in it, uh, learn from professors, from uh, learned professors, right. similar to the one sitting to my right, right. who was my teacher <laughs> in high school. Oh, is that right? Yes. I did not yes. know that. I'm very, very happy to be here to, uh, to express how important uh, History Makers is. Uh, Juliana Richardson uh, has uh, given me the uh, privilege of seeing a lot of her co uh, concerts and her uh, expose the aids of different scientists. And right. I learned a lot of things about our history. You got to know where you've been in order to know where you're going. Sure. And she's making a wonderful contribution to the world with her uh, her uh, videotaped right. uh, interviews. Yeah. yeah. This uh, collection is not only for us, it's for everyone yeah. here in this country and in the world because this is available to anybody to who anybody. can tap into it. Sure. It's extremely important, uh, not only for our people, but for others to know not only what those of us who've had the opportunity to perform and be in front of the public uh, on the world stages, but also to know what people have contributed over the years who don't make the media, who don't uh -oh. get into the headlines. Right. Right. These are people who, doctors, lawyers, business persons, uh, youngsters need to know that there's a wide range of possibility for sure. it. I have, over the past three or four years, uh, visited public schools, elementary schools in Ann Arbor, where I live. And, you know, children are the hardest audiences <laughs> in the world, <laughs> you know. But they are eager. They're sponges. They're eager to hear what you have to say. And the message always is, stay in school. Don't let anyone talk you out of fulfilling, completing your education. What you want to do and, and your dreams. Because there are, there, there are tremendous influences outside yeah. that will tell you, oh, you don't need to go to school. You, you can make it on your own. And that's not the message that young people need to hear. Yeah. It's hard work. It's <laughs> frustrating. But it pays big dividends. Yeah. 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 I, it strikes me that all three of you uh, uh, came of age uh, at a time when it was really different, uh, especially for African Americans in terms of opportunity. And I'm not sure uh, that, that young people today quite appreciate the, the, the difference and, and, and how difficult it could be. Yeah, you know, for the last three years, uh, I have uh, gone to King High School uh -huh. and uh, we have the, uh, the freshmen uh, come to the, uh, to the uh, audience, it's the audience there. And uh, one of the things that I talk to them about is, and which I think is the most important thing you can do is, is set goals. You know, you gotta have some goals. You know, right. if you don't have any goals, uh, you don't know in what direction you're gonna go, you know. So, so uh, you know, I talk to them about goal setting, uh -huh. you know, because I think at that age, you know, right. goal setting is so, so very important uh, in uh, what, what they're going to, to be because if you don't set any goals, uh, then you are um, um, apt to uh, go to the, the, the wrong direction. Sure, you know, sure. your goals is the thing that, that keeps you on a, on a straight and narrow. You know, and so I, I think it's just great that she, uh, Juliana, has uh, with the history makers have, have gotten us uh, to come uh, back and go into the, the the high schools and, and talk to the kids about yeah. uh, about uh, their education and uh, and about uh, obtaining you know those goals in life because uh, you know I say uh, you know what is happiness. You know, it's, it's happiness eating and drinking and being married and everything is going my way with the happiness of conflict and tension. But happiness is, is as you as you accomplish your goals and objectives in life, the happier you are. So right. most important thing, if you're going to, you know, you, and I say, first thing I say is, how many out here want to be sad? 
<laughs> nobody. Nobody. Right? Nobody. Right? nobody. Right? How many wants to be happy? <laughs> Everybody. I said, hey, so, hey, this is a way that you can, you, what you right. can do in order to achieve happiness. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you started uh, the dealership uh, after your football career, I imagine, though, that, that, that uh, being African American, that was something that probably some people said, hey, you know what? You can't do this. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing how things happen, you know. Uh, my father uh, was a uh, car dealer uh -huh. in Beaumont, Texas, uh -huh. right? and uh, he was a used car dealer. Uh, so uh, my brother and my father and I, we used to uh, go to the junkyard, get cars and fix them up and sell them, all right? right. And so I, ironically, uh, you know, I, I get drafted by the Detroit Lions, I come here, and uh, boy, there was a ride here, all right? And at that time, Henry Ford the second said, you know what, we're going to make automobile agencies available to African Americans. To African Americans, right. And so I said, wow, you know, that's the brother of the guy who owns the Lions. Right? <laughs> so you know what I did uh, is I went to uh, and got a job at Ford Motor Company. And for seven years, I worked at Ford Motor Company to, to learn the, the so retail automotive business. business. Yeah. And so when I uh, quit playing football, boom, I stepped right into uh, to business right. and grew the largest African American business in the country. Yeah, yeah. And, and thinking about that sort of second act, I think, is something that... Uh, that I can feel all three of you have done. I mean, you with the dealership, of course, uh, Councilwoman Reeves, you Absolutely. went into politics. That after, was also uh, one of the first artists on, on um, Motown to go on the Motown Review. Right, that's right. They, that's they did right. uh, at least 12 acts and the 12 piece band put us on a broken down trailway and had us tour the, the United States. And I've seen uh, segregated audiences but become intimate at yeah. the end of a show, hugging and kissing people who they wouldn't speak to prior to <laughs> right. the show starting. Right. Uh, having uh, been gr growing up in the church, having my, at, at age of three at my grandfather's church, win candy with my two older brothers singing gospel, and having that as roots in my life, uh, knowing that uh, prayer, answered prayer, is the result of, uh, I'm the result of a product of good teachers, but answered prayer. Right. Yes, having faith, knowing that uh, it's God's talent, and uh, He's our director. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, Mr. Shirley, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, always struck at uh, uh, black classical musicians uh, and, and the sort of struggle that they must uh, encounter just in terms of uh, surprise, really, that, 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 uh, that, they, that they do that. It's just not something uh, that, that I think a lot of people think of when they think of African-American artists. Well, one of the things that I, I'm most proud of is the fact that I've been able, I've been blessed with the opportunity to make a career uh, and become successful in doing something that most people didn't expect me to do. Right. And that's God's doing. Yeah. Because when I was in school in Detroit, uh -huh. you couldn't drag me to an opera. Yeah. <laughs> My, you know, spirituals, growing up in the church. Uh, art songs, yes, I loved cl uh, symphonic music, but yeah. I thought opera was pretty silly. Yeah. But it was when I was in the army that someone said, you know, you can, you have the stuff to become an opera singer. So I thought, well, since someone's said that who's been there and done it, I didn't want to come back to Detroit to resume my teaching career, which was interrupted by the military draft. By the military, sure. Uh, I didn't want to come back without taking the chance. I thought, well, if I come back and resume teaching, and I have a really talented student who shows career potential, well, I'm not going to tell him about the business. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. So I gave myself two years to find out about it, <laughs> and it went further than I thought, yeah, which right. simply means for me that when I walked out on stage this little company up in Woodstock, New York, to make my debut in Deflator Mouse, I knew I was doing what I was born to do. Yeah. yeah. So God guides. Um, it's interesting. <clears> then <throat> Mel talks about goal setting. Uh -huh. Two of the disciplines in education that have come under tremendous attack and are still under attack are music uh, yeah, and sports. Right. Sports and arts, uh, that's right. But both of, both of which are about goal setting. Yeah. Uh, a football player, you have to have a goal in <laughs> mind when you get the ball. Right. And you learn how to do what you need to do to get there and achieve that goal. Yeah. Same with music. You have a performance to give and you have to work to do it. And these are disciplines that teach young people how to pursue their goals. And unfortunately, people who are responsible for well, education these days don't right? understand that it's not so much about becoming a professional football player, professional musician. It's about training the, the brain the mind uh, to think in certain right, ways. And that discipline. I, uh, Councilman, I know you do a lot of work uh, with young people, sort of encouraging 
uh, arts education and things like that. And I let them know that I'm just a product of good teachers. Had I not had a commercial course in high school, I could never have made it at Motown because yeah. I was a secretary for nine months before I went on tour right. because I had the skills, because I could answer a phone properly yeah. and because I knew how to, the protocol of an office procedure. So it's all about getting in where you fit in. But if you have your education, you could do all things. Yeah. So now you said that uh, he was your teacher yes. in high school. Yes. Where, 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 where was Miller. it? At Miller. At, at Miller High School. Yes. Miller High school. I was there for wow. two years and then they made it a, a junior high and sent us to Northeastern High School where right. I learned to sing opera. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you Abraham, know, we have two singers Abraham on the Silver. panel here. We'll yeah, be Abraham lucky if we... Abraham Silver was my teacher. He allowed me Henry Ford Auditorium doing box aria. And that wow. was my debut. Forty-five hundred people. Then I got I got bit by the bug. I yeah. wanted to be in show business. <laughs> right. Uh, so tell me how you. I mean, you you defined Motown, of course. And 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 how did you get from from where you were to there? Just uh, having the skills. Yeah. I had been trained in high school to yeah. sing, so I went there already full of the knowledge of singing. Right. Plus, I also used to the radio while I washed the dishes in my house because I'm a family of 11 children. Right. Dad worked for the city of Detroit, so I'd sing t opera as I washed dishes. <laughs> Those are great. So I had classical roots. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and these are the stories people can hear in the, yes. in the History Makers. So uh, it's really great to have you guys here. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Thank Steve. you Steve. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can hear the program on WDET 101.9 FM. We'll see you next time. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.